Good afternoon, Ms. Gallagher. Uh, will you please introduce yourself briefly for the tribunal? Of course. Uh, I'm Keelan Gallagher. I'm an international human rights lawyer, originally qualified in Ireland, as you can probably tell from my strangely spelt name, practicing primarily from London as an international human rights lawyer. So I act in cases before various tribunals, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, UN Special Procedures, international courts, a judicial committee of the Privy Council and the UK courts. I also sit part-time as an assistant coroner, which is a part-time judicial role in England and Wales, which involves conducting inquests or investigations into suspicious deaths and violent deaths and deaths in state custody. But I think primarily uh, the reason that I'm here today as a witness is that I've got particular expertise in uh, attacks on journalists accountability for journalist deaths, and I act for many bereaved families whose loved ones have lost their lives simply for doing their jobs, for being journalists. You'll hear from one of them in a moment, uh, the wonderful Matthew Caruana Galizia, whose mother was killed in Malta in October 2017. And I act for many journalists who are currently harassed in a range of ways using lawfare, the law being used against them, including Maria Ressa, who you heard from earlier today, and I think finally, for completeness, I should flag uh, that I have also given expert evidence in some of the cases you're considering. You heard earlier this morning uh, very powerful evidence from Raisa Carrillo of FLIP uh, in relation to the case of Jeanette Bedoya Lima against Colombia. And I was an expert witness for the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in that case about gender-based violence and particular issues in respect of safety of women journalists. Thank you. Given your uh, extensive experience in, in across um, length of time that I think you know, encapsulates very well you know, the evolution of the issue of impunity that we've been attaching, I mean, attacking, attaching, attacking all day and, and discussing all day, would you identify and walk us through the legal obstacles uh, to justice in general for, for journalists when it comes to their death? Of course. Um, so question about legal obstacles to justice for journalists murdered in reprisal for their work. That's obviously a huge and multi-layered question, and I'm going to provide you with more detail in writing, but could I today focus on four specific points, which I hope help in the time we've got available? Uh, first, I just want to deal with some preliminary points. Uh, second, I want to highlight the importance of adopting a broad concept of impunity and not focusing purely on criminal liability. That's very important. Uh, third, I just want to flag, in light of some of the evidence earlier, some specific issues about women journalists and the importance of a gender-sensitive approach. And then fourth, I want to highlight some key shortcomings of existing international mechanisms when states fail to act. So starting with preliminary remarks, the first thing to say is, of course, that legal obstacles depend on a number of factors, and I'd highlight three in particular. A, the state in which the murder occurs. Fundamentally different issues arise when you're dealing with the murder of a journalist in a state which is simply not rule of law compliant, doesn't have a functioning judiciary, for example, um, and the murder of a journalist in a state, for example, uh, which might have a strong regional mechanism to hold the state to account if they don't take the action they're obliged to, like a Council of Europe member state. And I know this isn't something we're touching on today, but I do just want to mention it. There are very particular legal obstacles arising, which I see in my work, when you have murders of journalists in conflict zones, which I won't go into in detail, but I'm happy to help further. And um, the second point, B, is whether there's an extraterritorial element to the case. An increasing trend, which I'm seeing in my work, is states attempting to silence their critics across borders. Uh, so, including online attacks, physical attacks, rendition and kidnapping, uh, and threats of death on foreign soil, and indeed deaths on foreign soil. Now, we see that in countries like Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Iran, Russia. We saw a very extreme example earlier this year in the case of Belarus, commandeering a Ryanair plane in order to bring journalists within their jurisdiction. So that extraterritoriality issue is a real challenge. And by way of example, I act for 150 BBC Persian journalists, so journalists at the BBC World Service, primarily based in London, and they face rape threats, debt threats, online abuse, harassment of their families back in Tehran, even though they live in London. And in my view, where you have an extraterritorial element to the case, 
And my view is that our systems really fail and are particularly poor at dealing with that issue when you've got a journalist located in one place with the threat coming from another. And the final uh, example to give is the nature of the murder. There's fundamentally different legal issues arising and legal obstacles to navigate when you're considering a state perpetrated execution, such as uh, Iran's extraterritorial kidnapping of Ruhollah Zam and his execution in December last year, and situations in which state agents have colluded in a journalist's murder, for example, by leaking information about their whereabouts, or situations in which states have facilitated or encouraged an assassination by private individuals, non-state actors, or where states have failed to take adequate steps. So uh, I'm afraid it's a real lawyer's answer to start by giving lots of caveats. Um, but when you think about legal obstacles, these things are all very important because the legal obstacles are so context specific, as Irene Khan and others have pointed out. I should also say the phrase uh, justice for journalists is also a tricky one. Uh, what I find working with bereaved families who've lost their loved ones is that justice means very different things for different people. So for some bereaved families, uh, they want a criminal conviction. They want to see someone behind bars and answerable for what they've done. Uh, for others, it's fundamental for them that there's change and that other journalists are protected going forward. And the themes I tend to see um, in terms of what justice means, but it's very specific to the individual brief families, are they want answers about what happened, because often the death has occurred in circumstances where the information is very murky. So they just want basic information about what in fact happened. Uh, they want accountability of some kind, whether that's criminal accountability or compensation or some other form. And they want change, so others aren't placed at risk. And but the fourth element, which is really important with journalists, I think, is that the story doesn't die with the journalist. And uh, the phrase that's used uh, by the Forbidden Stories Project is, killing the journalist must not kill the story. And that's really vital, it seems to me. And in fact, it's also a protective mechanism, because when you pick off an individual journalist to try to gag them, sometimes described as the ultimate form of censorship to assassinate a journalist, that's much less likely to work if we have collaborative journalism networks, if we have things like the Forbidden Stories Project, if we have things like CPJ's The Last Column, and if we have the kind of collaborative journalism we've seen with multiple different organizations working together. Um, so I should say that. So second topic I wanted to cover is on impunity. And uh, I'm afraid many of you in the room may have heard me on this particular soapbox before, but the focus often, I find, is exclusively upon impunity in the sense of criminal impunity. Has there been a criminal investigation? Has there been a prosecution? Have there been convictions of the perpetrators? That statistic that we've heard repeatedly, the UNESCO statistic, which is between eight and nine out of 10 uh, journalist murders going unpunished, is about criminal impunity. But in many of the cases in which I act, impunity is not only about the perpetrators, whether the foot soldiers or the contract killers or the masterminds are those who funded the killing. Impunity is a far broader concept and I would urge the prosecution team and the People's Tribunal when looking at this issue to think of impunity in that broader way. In many cases, for example, an attack may come from a non-state actor, from a private individual, but the context is a climate of impunity facilitated by or fueled by the state. And we often see impunity afterwards. The bottom line is uh, journalists step on some pretty powerful toes in their line of work. And too often, those in power have minimal incentive to investigate, let alone pursue justice in those circumstances. And that's why you get that persistent 90% or between 80 and 90% statistic with, as Irene Khan said earlier, the needle not moving and stubbornly staying. It's a stubborn statistic which has remained despite many fine words and many resolutions on paper which haven't in fact changed that statistic. But I would ask, don't focus only on that criminal issue. Look at the broader concept of impunity. See, for example, the wonderful recent judgment of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in the Geneth Bedoya case. Look at the Council of Europe's standards in the cases like Dink and Turkey, its 2016 recommendation and its 2020 recommendation, which focus on the obligation on the state to foster an environment in which journalists may, be, may practice their trade safely and free from harassment by state or private actors. There's an obligation on the state to create an enabling and favorable media environment. And if they fail to do that, 
that is something they must be held to account for. Even if they didn't pull the trigger, even if they didn't pay for someone else to pull the trigger, they are complicit in those circumstances. And I'd also ask the People's Tribunal to consider international impunity and not just within state borders. May I give one example? I know you're going to hear from Matthew uh, very shortly uh, about his mother, but I want to give it as an example of looking at impunity in that broader way. So when Daphne was assassinated in October 2017, it was deeply shocking in many ways. It was the brutal murder of a journalist in a car bomb in a European country, Malta losing the voice of the journalist often referred to as their national conscience. But frankly, and I know Matthew agrees with this, in many other ways, it was not at all shocking. This was not a bolt from the blue killing. It followed three decades of harassment and abuse of Daphne, multiple attempts to silence her. Ten days before her assassination, she spoke to the Council of Europe about her life and what it had become. She described arson attacks on her home, attacks on her pets, attempts to cut off her income, the freezing of her bank accounts, dozens and dozens of libel suits brought by ministers, business people, vile misogynistic attacks online, critics in the street calling her a witch. And she said, you get used to it like a scar forms round a wound. And when you read that interview from 10 days before her death, you can see she set out in her own words the danger she was in. And 10 days later, she was dead. This was an entirely preventable death. It followed years of state-sanctioned harassment. It took place in a culture of total impunity. And importantly, the killing also came in a culture of total impunity in relation to the subject matter of her reporting, including corruption, organized crime, and ethical failures at every level of Maltese society. And within days and weeks of Daphne's death, Matthew and his brothers were accusing the state and the then Prime Minister Joseph Muscat of being complicit in her killing for precisely that reason, because a culture of impunity had been allowed to flourish by the government in Malta. And Matthew said at the time, it's of little comfort for the, for the Prime Minister to say he will not rest until the perpetrators are found when he heads a government that encouraged that same impunity. Bottom line is, if the institutions in Malta were working properly, there simply wouldn't be an assassination to investigate. Now, Matthew said that in 2017, and three months ago, the independent public inquiry in Malta published a 437-page report which agrees entirely with what Matthew said then. It found that the Maltese state should shoulder responsibility for her death. It's a damning report which says a culture of impunity was created from the highest echelons of power within the Castile in Malta. And that former Prime Minister, Joseph Muscat, was singled out and identified as enabling that culture of impunity. So if you have a situation like that, where the government creates a favorable climate for anyone seeking to eliminate a journalist like Daphne, to know that they will do so with the minimum of consequences, uh, they are essentially giving a green light to her being treated as a target. And the report, of course, also found that the state failed to recognize the real and immediate risks to her life and failed to take protective steps to avoid those risks. So why do we, three months on, find ourselves without a meaningful response to that report by the Maltese government? Indeed, the Maltese government has yet to even release an English translation of the 437-page Report. I hope Matthew won't mind me saying that not many people uh, speak Maltese. Um, I think slightly more than speak Irish, a language in which I am fluent, which is rather unhelpful, I've got to say. Um, but what translations you've heard or read have been provided by the bereaved family and their legal team? Uh, not, their, not the state. Even that very basic step to commit to transparency, enable the international community to understand what happened and hold Malta to account has simply not been taken. But I also emphasize that the climate of impunity was not Malta specific. This is not a tale about a particular island off the coast of Europe. Whilst that climate of impunity festered in Malta, the world stood idly by. Daphne reported, you can read it in her blog, Running Commentary, and the world did not listen. And states who have close relationships with Malta like the UK, countries across Europe, countries which now proudly announce that they are members of the Media Freedom Coalition, did nothing to protect Daphne or to hold Malta to account. Uh, my view is they ignored what was happening under their noses and left Daphne 
to her fate, even in the four years since. We've had to have a huge fight to secure support from many states who purport to support media freedom. I, I find, as an international lawyer in this space, it's far easier to get states to be critical of other states, which are far away, with whom they don't have good relations, they don't have good trade relations or economic ties. You try to get them to criticise their allies, it's very difficult. And that similar theme of a climate of impunity within a perpetrator state being allowed to continue by other states and the international community is a familiar tale. We see it with Jamal Khashoggi as well. Uh, we see it uh, with my brave, brilliant client, Maria Ressa, and the Philippines, uh, where Maria faces a succession of cases that seek to criminalise her reporting, expose her to 100 years in prison. Uh, and she has been subjected to what the Filipino National Union of Journalists calls a shameless act of persecution by a bully government. But Duterte is openly contemptuous of journalists. He said a number of years ago, just because you're a journalist, you're not exempted from assassination if you're a son of a bitch. Uh, his former campaign spokesperson called journalists prostitutes. Now, when you have that kind of language emanating from government, is it any wonder that this year in the Philippines we have seen 20 <coughs> murders of journalists and we're not even at the end of the year yet? And yet, why does the Philippines enjoy preferential trade status with the EU, GSP plus status, uh, which is a recognition of a country which complies with international human rights standards. Because the Philippines is very good at signing up to international treaties and signing up to promises on paper. It doesn't follow through in practice, but the international community has failed so far to hold it to account. I'm very conscious of the time, so may I just flag in relation to specific threats to women journalists. It just occurred to me over the course of the evidence today that it may be helpful to provide the People's Tribunal and the prosecution team with some uh, additional information, and I'm happy to do this if helpful, uh, on the importance of having a gender-sensitive approach when looking at women journalists. I've mentioned Daphne and Maria. There's some chilling common themes in the material I see in those cases with misogynistic, sexist memes, rape threats, calling them witches, circulating dehumanizing images which stop them being perceived as people. Uh, and I also see that with, for example, my BBC Persian clients I mentioned earlier. Let me give you one example. Uh, a fake photoshopped picture uh, with one of my clients' faces um, photoshopped onto a pornographic image uh, was sent to my client's 14-year-old son at his school in London. So, and that's obviously particularly disturbing because it says, we know where you are. We know where your son goes to school. So uh, I would say these are generic, general, global phenomenons that women face different types of threats, different natures of threats, and women have differential barriers to accessing justice. But I would say it's important to look, when we think about women journalists, at the impact on four levels. The indiv individual journalists themselves, women journalists more generally, because targeted attacks like that have an impact on other women in that space and it means a silencing of women who would otherwise contribute to public debates. It also, uh, importantly, has an impact on the wider audience, and Irene Khan touched on this earlier, because in addition to raising grave concerns about the protection of freedom of expression and the rights of women to be free from gender-based violence and harassment, those kind of behaviours, whether by state or non-state actors, undermine the free flow of ideas and the rights of audiences to hear women's voices in the media and to have a diverse media. And then final, finally, there's a potential wider discriminatory impact upon women more generally, compounding unequal patterns in the media about women's roles. So the IWMF Global Report on the status of women in the news media has identified that women represent only a third of the full-time journalism workforce in the uh, over 500 companies it surveyed, with particular gaps in frontline investigative reporting roles. And the difficulty, if you don't crack down on these issues, it just compounds and perpetuates that pattern. So there's that issue. Final thing I wanted to turn to uh, before finishing up um, is uh, on legal obstacles where the state fails to act. Now, in international law, the primary obligation is upon the state in question to act. But when the state fails to act, how can you hold them to account? Now, some states... We have a means to bring them to account within domestic legal systems. 
We can bring a challenge to say, why have you not conducted this investigation? Why have you not conducted this prosecution? We can challenge them in that way um, against established standards. With others, we can bring them to account within a regional system, like the Inter-American uh, Court. Uh, as in Daphne's case, we always had the threat of being able to go to the European Court of Human Rights if Malta didn't do the right thing. Um, some states have signed optional protocols to treaties which allow us, for example, to file an individual complaint about them before UN treaty bodies, and in some circumstances, uh, the matter can come to the International Criminal Court. But a key problem which happens again and again is that states have often constructed their systems in such a way as to render themselves immune from such mechanisms, and our options are then very limited. So, in many cases, we're left with a very thin range of options. We can make complaints, for example, to the UN Human Rights Council Special Procedures. You heard earlier today from Irene Khan, one of those mandate holders, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. Um, but, uh, first of all, UN Human Rights Council Special Procedures don't have access to many of the relevant states. They're simply not allowed in. So some of the ideas which we heard earlier, which I agree are fantastic in principle, there's just a fundamental difficulty. And if a state like Iran won't let the UN Special Rapporteur on Iran, Professor Javed Raymond, into the country, they are not going to allow this investigative task force into the country. So it's a fundamental problem when you've got uh, use of UN mechanisms in circumstances where states block it. Um, the special procedures in many ways uh, have no teeth, as my brilliant colleague Tatiana Eatwell, who's sitting there, has put it. Um, the UN special procedures have no bite. The reason is that states don't want to get bitten. And that's quite a good description of exactly what the problem is here. They have minimal resources and heavy workloads. They have very limited support. And UN special rapporteurs are not paid which is a problem for diversity in the role, but it's also a recipe for some people being brilliant and dynamic and putting a large amount of time into it, and others not giving the role the attention it needs or deserves. There's essentially a lottery going on about who you happen to get. You can get a very robust, dynamic, brilliant special rapporteur like Dr. Agnes Calamar, who decides in the case of Jamal Khashoggi, this is not good enough. I'm going to appoint my own ad hoc group I'm going to go and try and fill the investigative void left by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, left by Turkey, a Council of Europe country, uh, on the grounds of which uh, Jamal was killed. Uh, but there's no means of appealing if your UN Special Rapporteur or the working group doesn't engage. There's no comeback. There's no means to challenge it. We can also, of course, urge other states to step in. Uh, but regrettably, they often fail to do so. And before I finish, I just wanted to give you one final example which gives an indication of the problems you face when the perpetrator state has failed to act. Ten years ago, in early 2011, uh, our, client, um, our client's husband, Anton Hammerl, a brilliant photojournalist and photographer, travelled from his home in London to Libya to cover the civil war. He was a courageous, brilliant journalist, deeply committed to his craft, and he entered Libya at a time when Gaddafi's forces were suspected of serious violations of international humanitarian law, including war crimes, crimes against humanity, to tell the world what was truly happening and bring accurate accounts to the world. And days after arriving in Libya, on April 5th, 2011, Anton and three other journalists, one of whom was the US journalist James Foley, Jim Foley, whose name many of you will know, came under fire while covering the conflict from Gaddafi loyalist forces. And as the family understood it at the time, the four journalists had been kidnapped and were held for a period of over six weeks. And our client, Penny Sukraj Hamerl, only discovered that Anton had in fact been killed at that initial point when the journalists were ambushed by Gaddafi forces. Six weeks later, when she saw on TV three journalists being released, not four, and she saw that her husband wasn't there. And at the time, she had a seven-year-old son and a six-week-old baby. Uh, they are now 17 and 10 and remarkable young men. And Penny and her two children have decided this is simply not good enough. And they've now instructed an international team. We're in a position where lawyers and other journalists are trying to piece together what happened on that day with the aid of really wonderful investigative work by James Foley himself before he was beheaded by ISIS, because he himself felt he had been a witness to a war crime on that day in April 2011, and the world did not care. And that is why he started investigating it. So we've now got his notebooks and we're piecing it together.
But it seems to us, in these circumstances, Libya and the new government has zero interest in investigating Anton Hamerl's death, even though, on the face of it, war crimes and serious crimes against humanity were committed. So why will other governments not step in? Anton was a South African and an Austrian dual national. South Africa and Austria could step in and fill that investigative void. He and his family lived in the UK. Indeed, if his body had been returned, Penny would have been entitled automatically to a full coroner's inquest and an investigation. Because his body is missing, she doesn't get it. So where you have an investigative void like this, Libya not acting, it's simply not good enough for other states to call on Libya to take action. They should take action themselves. And key to, investi key to justice for journalists in these circumstances, the first step is getting that investigation. And that's what gives you the answers, ultimately a route towards accountability and change, all those things which are so important. But it seems to me you should not need to have a courageous, articulate, brilliant widow like Penny, or a son like Matthew, or a fiancé like Hatice, to secure even the most basic of steps towards accountability. Bereaved families and their loved ones should not have to shoulder this burden. It's frankly disgraceful that bereaved families, lawyers, and other journalists end up doing the digging which states should do themselves or the international community should undertake when those states fail. And for that reason, uh, I wish this People's Tribunal all the very best of luck. It's such an important job that you're doing, shining a light on issues which would otherwise be neglected. Thank you very much.